Oh, I see a lot of questions already. Wow. Got my coffee. Let's get it on. Yes, today's going to be an interesting topic about buy and hold investing versus active investing. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining me. As always, let me know in the comments if you can't hear me or see me. Everything looks good. So welcome to episode 43 of the Volatility Barometer. So um, you'll have to bear with me today. I actually went golfing for the first time in a very long time. I, the last time I went golfing was, I think it was last October in Canada. So it's been almost a year since I played. I'm here in Dubai now. I joined a golf club. I was on the waiting list for a pretty long time. My name came up, so um, I took the opportunity and I actually played my first round today. I was only intending to play nine holes, but I played pretty quickly. I was just out there by myself. There was nobody on the golf course. So uh, I ended up playing the full 18. It was hot, it was um, 43 degrees Celsius here. So when I use my phone app, it's also, Dubai is a very, very uh, humid place as well. A lot of people think, oh, it it's, must be a dry heat. It's not at all, it's very humid as well. So uh, the Humidex, the real feel Humidex on my phone hit a high of 48, which I believe for you Americans is about 118 Fahrenheit. Um, it was a scorcher, it was, it was tough, it was manageable. Um, you know, you're in a cart. I drank a gallon of water, um, sunscreen a few times. Yeah, it's fine. It's hot though, for sure. Uh, played pretty well, had some fun, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hurting. My back hurts, my feet hurt. I have a splitting headache. I think I have heat stroke or something's wrong with me. Um, I think my eyeballs got burned, so I might be squinting through this, but okay, I'm going to tough it, tough it out. I said I'd do live streams once a week, so here we go. Uh, I found a topic for this week. Just something stood out at me. I was scrolling through Twitter. Something jumped off the page, so I kind of organized a whole topic around it. So we'll get into that. But before we do, just really quickly, if you do want to get a little help with your investing, of course, today I'm going to be talking about active investing, which is something that I do. Of course, at the end of today, you'll think, you know, it'll be pretty obvious that I'm a believer in trying to beat the market. But if you do want to uh, see what I do here, if you're ever curious, you know, you've been on the live streams for a while and you don't really know what it is, you can go to my website, volatilitytradingstrategies.com, go to the subscribe tab. And if you sign up for the monthly subscription, there is a two week free trial. So you can check it out for a couple of weeks. It's everything. You'll see all the trades, all the emails, the full service for a couple of weeks. And of course you can decide later on if it is right for you. You can feel free to cancel at any time. I won't be offended. But if you're ever curious about what I'm doing over here, uh, there you go. You can take the free trial available to everybody. If you've done it before, feel free to do it again. I don't mind at all. I don't scour through the emails and say, oh, that guy did it last year. Um, whatever. If you want to see what the up-to-date stuff is, feel free to take that free trial. So let's try, let me attempt today to uh, put on a reasonably good show. Boy, I'm having a hard time seeing. Um, I should probably buy some sunglasses or something. It was, a, it, was, it was a rough one. So today we are going to talk about a subject that, um, I don't know if I would say it. Well, yeah, I can say that it does. It bothers me. It bothers me when people talk about it in a certain way. Certain types of people who say it bother me. So like I said, I was scrolling through Twitter. And I never, you know, call anybody out. This isn't a B for anything. I'm just, you know, something caught my eye and I happened to say, oh, that's, that's an interesting subject for a live stream. So here was the tweet in question. Buy and hold is the best strategy for retail investors, in my honest opinion. And that's great. People can have their opinion, whatever, that's fine. Whether it's real estate, stocks, ETFs, small businesses, just buy and hold. Now, I'm not really sure what that means, buy and hold small businesses, but surely what they're essentially saying is that uh, buy and hold is the best way to go for retail investors. So you can read my response if you want. In fact, maybe I just will. I said there's a lot to unpack here, but if you take an honest look at the average income, savings rate, cost of living, inflation, you come to the conclusion quickly that most people do have to try to beat the market. Don't shy away from things just because they are hard. So my general point is that you can't just make blanket statements like this. And that's why I say that 
You know, I guess I can say definitively that it really does bother me when people say what tell everybody that you should buy and hold invest because there is an awful lot of people out there. Everybody's in a different situation, different income, different savings rate, different time frame that maybe they started late, started early. Obviously, you can't make any generalizations, but it's more than that because if you convince people that buy and hold investing is the best way to do it, the current situation, of course, the retirement crisis, that it's very real. We are in one, we are seeing one, and we're setting up for worse ones in the future. But if this pervasive idea that buy and hold investing is going to be good enough for most people, that's just going to continue. So I'm definitely going to illustrate today that that is probably not going to be good enough for very many people. So let me get started. But before we get into the numbers, because I, I prepared a bunch of charts and stuff and we'll go into a compound growth calculator. I'll, I'll prove my point definitively. But before we do that, I just want to say there's a couple of reasons why it bothers me just in general. And one of them is you have to look at the people giving the advice, right? If, if people are saying buy and hold, well, why are they saying that? What's their financial situation? So first of all, I'm not ever going to, you know, say anybody's name or stuff on, on live streams, but the person here is a doctor, right? Good for them. They're obviously a very smart person, but if you're a surgeon, clearly you have a good income and you probably in the future will have a stable income and might not have to actually worry about investing too much. But who else gives this type of advice? What types of people give this type of advice? Again, I'm not calling anybody out, all of these people have done great things. They're helping a lot of people. I have no problem with most of what they do. But with investing advice specifically, you know, you've people like Dave Ramsey, of course. But Dave Ramsey's not an investor. He doesn't make his money investing. He's, last I saw, I think he's worth about $200 million. And he makes his money on television and YouTube and book deals and courses and selling seminars. That's where he makes his money. So to say, you know, his audience should just buy and hold index funds. This is uh, not only wrong, but dangerous. You're leading a lot of people down a path. You know, Jack Bogle, of course, unfortunately, no, no, no longer with us. But just to make the point, founder of Vanguard Group. Why would somebody like Jack Bogle tell people that buy and hold, hold forever, just buy these ETFs and never sell them? Well, that's how they get paid. That's where the fees come in, right? I mean, it's not difficult to see. There's a little bit of bias here. People like Tony Robbins, I actually like Tony Robbins, just for no other reason than he's just so amped and excited and, you know, obviously trying his best to help as many people as he can. That's awesome. But when it comes to financial advice, again, for him, he does have relationships with financial institutions where they do collect, you know, they largely buy and hold investing, collect massive fees. And, you know, it's not difficult to see why somebody would say that if it's not their expertise. This one here is the one that bothers me the most, and this represents financial advisors and financial planners. This one, the other three categories of people, influencers that will give this terrible advice, I can give them a pass. Financial advisors and financial planners, I cannot. I think that that is outright negligence. And the reason that I say that is because they are supposed to know better. They're the ones that are looking at the data, they're looking at the information, and they should know better. They should know that the vast majority of investors are not going to have enough money in retirement, and they should know that the rate of return that they're proposing in these pie charts that they're recommending are not going to get people to the finish line. They're still going to get their fees. So that advisor is still going to be taken care of, and they probably make a very good income. But the problem with it is if you were to be totally honest, and that advisor sat down with a client and they just said the absolute truth. You know, some of those movies, um, what was that one with, um, it was Jim Carrey, He Couldn't Lie, or that other one with Ricky Gervais where the invention of a lie, he can lie. But if you just sat down with an advisor and they had to say the truth, essentially the deal would be, they would tell you something to the effect of 80% of active managers underperform the benchmark. They would say, I'm not one of them that knows how to do that, so I'm in the 80%. I don't know how to beat the benchmark either, so I'm going to put you in pie charts that are going to basically buy and hold. They're going to guarantee you a very low rate of return. I'm going to collect fees from you, and 40 years from now, you're not going to have enough money in retirement. That's essentially the deal when you sit down with an advisor. 
That's what they should tell you. Now, of course, they're not going to say that. They're going to say something fantastic, like you're going to make 8 to 10% a year and you're going to be just fine. That is not the reality. So that's why financial advisors in particular, they're the ones that really bother me the most because they're the ones that among everybody, they really should know a lot better than that. So let's give all these other people a pass, but financial advisors. The other thing is, I'm not going to call anybody, you know, anything derogatory. I'm not using this word as an insult. I just think that that's kind of a loser's attitude, to be honest. When you say something like, you know, 80% of asset managers underperform the benchmark, Wall Street doesn't do very well in their investments, 20% of the people succeed, 80% fail, so we shouldn't even try. I got to say, I, I feel like that's kind of a loser's attitude. You, I, I don't know what times have changed, but when I was growing up and, you know, maybe just call me old or whatever, but I was told that anything worth doing is going to be difficult. I wasn't of the generation where everybody gets participation trophies and competition is forbidden and everybody's equal and all of this and don't do difficult things and don't chase your dreams. I'm not of that generation. So when I see people say, and this is essentially what they're saying. Only 20% of the people will succeed, so don't even try. I, I, don't, I don't support that at all. When I hear somebody say only 20% succeed, my attitude is roll up your sleeves, work hard, make sure you're one of the 20%. I'm not the person that goes the other way, like, you know, that seems hard, let's just not do it. I was a professional golfer. The odds of making it as a pro golfer are you know, 0 0.0001. There's millions of people playing. There's 125 full-time players on the tour. Colleges, absolutely packed with people who train every day, who can definitely play just about as well as everybody else. And only a handful of them are going to make it. I still tried. So you don't have to be crazy like me and just chase a dream that is totally unrealistic. But 20% is not that bad. I mean, people should still try to be in the top 20%. I don't think that's asking too much. So kind of think it's a defeatist attitude. Don't not do something just because it's hard. That's kind of silly. So anyway, let's get to the actual numbers. Why do I say that buy and hold might not be good enough? Well, I did a Twitter poll today. I'm sure probably some of you have seen it. I asked how much money do you think people will need in retirement? And overwhelmingly, people said over $2 million. But you can see 1 million and 2 million, basically over 90% of the people are saying, you're going to need an awful lot of money. So is buy and hold investing, mathematically speaking, going to get people to that finish line? Well, we need a buy and hold investment to compare with. So let's use probably one of the most famous ones, made famous by Ray Dalio of Bridgewater. You can see Bridgewater is obviously a massive company, so lots of people are going to be investing in similar things to this. But uh, yeah, it's called the all-weather portfolio. You can simulate it with low-cost ETFs. It's basically stocks, bonds, gold, commodities. And the commodities ETF that we're using, DBC, it launched in 2006. So you can see this is the all-weather portfolio. This is the buy and hold sort of, this is the one, maybe do an annual rebalance or something, but you put your money in this, and this is what's supposed to get you to the finish line. So in the last, what is that, uh, 17 17 years, 18 years, it's made 6.75%, drawdown 17%. Not great, but we have a problem because we have to adjust for inflation, right? Obviously, inflation eats away at this. So if you adjust for inflation, it's actually down to 4.22%. Now, it's possible that you could bump that up a little bit if you, say, over-allocated to the stock market, for example. So if we go to an S&P 500 calculator, Let's use the same exact time frame, and you can see, just for inflation, stock market 4.4. If you reinvest all your dividends along the way, it's 6.5. So you can see that if you were to take some type of hybrid where you increase the stock allocation, you might be able to get the 4.2 up to 5% or something. But it's not going to be overly impressive. That's the point, is that when you go through bull markets and bear markets, these buy and hold pie charts that the financial advisors, this guy, will tell you gets you to the retirement finish line, it most certainly is not going to. And I think people need to know that ahead of time. You don't want to waste 30 years and then have a shortfall. But it gets worse than this, because this is over the last 17 years. But what are we seeing now? 
we're seeing massive inflation. Now, I don't know how long it's going to last. Maybe this fizzles out and dies and we go back to 2 or 3%. Who knows? But it is possible that we go through a period of extended inflation, which means that this number gets nothing but worse. And what we also can say is bonds, interest rates are extremely low. So the bond aspect of this is mathematically not going to do nearly as well as it did over this time period. And we can say that stocks are basically near all-time highs, and those are probably not going to do as well going forward either. So this 4.2 could very easily go down to 2 or 3. I could see that happening easily. So why would that matter anyway? Dave Ramsey's worth $200 million. Tony Robbins is worth nearly a billion. If these people make 4.2%, it's no problem at all. If this guy, who's a surgeon, makes 42 that's going to be just fine. But does that speak to the average American? That's the question. Well, no, it doesn't. The average American makes $67,500 a year. Now, you know, that's the median income in the United States. It might sound like a lot to you. It might sound like not very much, but that's half the country makes that or less. But that's not all your money. Of course, you have to pay taxes. The United States isn't the highest tax country in the world, but it's reasonably high taxes. Long term, the average median effective tax rate paid in the United States is 22.6%. So only 77.4% of this money is actually theirs. But it gets worse because the personal savings rate is low in the United States as well because life costs money. And in the U.S., in many cities, it costs a lot of money. You've got rent. You've got food. You've, if you have kids, you've got massive expenses, health care, unbelievable expenses. Child care is out of control. If you have to send your kids to university these days, I mean, good luck. There's a lot of reasons why people are only saving 5% of their income. So if you've got the average American who's making 67500 and they only get to keep that much of their own money, and then they're only saving 5.4% of their money, the average American is only saving $235 a month. That is not very much money. Now, I'm not making a judgment call. I'm just saying that if you're trying to get to a good retirement number, that's not very much money. So it's not overly surprising that this is the st statistics that we have now. Now, the average net worth for Americans is 750, That's a good number. So if, you, you know, if you've got 750K net worth, of course, net worth includes everything, including the equity in your home. It's basically just all of your assets minus all of your liabilities. That's what net worth is. So 750, that's fine, but that's the average. The, you know, the billionaires, Tony Robbins gets to bring that average up as well. So that's not actually that realistic. If we look at the median, that's the middle person in the United States. That's the 50th percentile person. Half of Americans have less than 121,000 in their net worth, which of course is not gonna be good enough. Now that's total all ages, but here is really the kicker. When we get to retirement age, the median net worth, of course, the average, because there's lots of millionaires and billionaires, it brings up the average, but there's a lot of Americans who have 250,000 or less. And there's actually a reasonable percent that have zero, which is sad to see and shouldn't really be happening in such a wealthy country, but you know, pretty phenomenal mismanagement along the way has led to some people slipping through the cracks. So $250,000 is the average person at retirement age. But I would even say that this probably goes up to about 70 or 80% of people who will have, say, half a million or less. And if anybody's ever actually crunched the numbers, how much you need in retirement, I'm not going to fully endorse this. I don't think you actually need $2 million, but I would say somewhere between 500 and a million is going to be kind of in the ballpark of what you should target. And I bet you 80% of Americans are going to be below that at retirement age. So this is why I am saying it is not really my opinion. This is a pretty indisputable mathematical fact that, you know, three quarters of Americans are not going to have the comfortable retirement they're looking for. So if these reckless and irresponsible mega millionaires are recommending people do something that virtually guarantees their failure, um, you know, again, I don't want to disparage anybody, but what words do we call that? I mean, at the very least, it's negligence. It's quite possibly you could think of a few words that are even worse than that. But let's go through the basically the numbers 
of what I'm suggesting as far as active, because remember, I'm basically saying that I believe active management is the only way to get people to the number they're actually looking for. Again, it might not be a million for you. It might be 500,000. If you live in a smaller city, it might be whatever it is, but you got to do it through active management. So this is a basic compound interest calculator starting at zero. We're assuming age 30. This is a huge assumption right from the start that's going to make buy and hold look really good. This is also what financial advisors will do. They'll do something that looks really, really impressive. But we're starting at age 30. Most people, that's not realistic. You know, you've got a lot of upfront expenses when you're younger. You know, you probably put a down payment on a home. Perhaps you drop 25000 on a wedding. You know, you've, you've got kids. It's very expensive early on. Plus your salary at that age probably isn't what it will be in 10 or 20 years later. So this is a very bold claim that somebody's going to start at age 30. Most people don't start saving until their 40s anyway, and, and a lot of times in their 50s. But there's that 4.22% rate of return. Again, I'm thinking it's going to be way worse than this going forward, but I'm going to use the averages. Probably not realistic. We're going to do the whole thing in a tax sheltered account, so you pay no capital gains. There's the 235, which is what the average American actually saves per month. And this is another fairly bold assumption. I'm actually going to assume that annual wage growth is going to outpace annual inflation over the next 40 years. It has in the past, but I'm actually quite concerned about this inflation number. As we go forward, certainly 10, 20, 30 years from now, the debt will start to matter more and more. So again, another bold assumption that makes buy and hold look very good. But if we use all of these assumptions and it's as rosy a picture as we could possibly paint, the buy and hold investor is gonna have just over 300,000. That's where that 250,000 number is coming from because a lot of people don't even do that as a basic. They don't make 0.35% a month. They didn't start when they were 30. They didn't have a good income right away. So that's where that number is coming from. It's not very good. But now here's my actual point of this whole thing. Because when people are talking about buy and hold versus active, I feel like they get a little bit out of control on the active side. And then you can also start criticizing those people for just putting out outlandish rates of return, expectations that are not ever going to really hit. So I'm not talking about active investing and trying to make 30, 40% a year. You know, if you go on Twitter, everybody on Twitter is a millionaire trader. But statistically speaking, we can see how few people actually are, right? So I'm not talking about crazy outlandish stuff. I'm talking about well-managed, focus on risk management, slow, steady progress along the way. And the rate of return that I often say, even though that my personal rate of return is much higher than this, the one that I like to use is 1% a month. That's all I'm saying is just 1% a month. 12% a year, now ignore the fact that this is arithmetic and not geometric compounding, but 1% a month. It's a target that I think is realistic. It's not going to put the person's account in huge jeopardy. We're not swinging for the fence here. Like I said, my rate of return is roughly around 20, but 12, I think is doable for active investors. So what would that do? What would happen if a person, everything is the same, they have the same job, they add the same amount of money, all the assumptions are the same, the only difference is they're going to try to make 12% a year as an active investor instead of this person who's obviously not going to make very much money as a buy and hold investor. What is the difference? Is everybody ready for this? What does that tiny little seemingly small increase do? Well, there's your $2 million retirement account. That's all it takes. Now, I say that's all it takes. That's not easy. I will fully grant that investing is difficult and making a 12% rate of return is not guaranteed. That is also hard to do. As we could pour over the statistics, not very many Wall Street firms are able to produce that, but it's worth doing. And there are people who can do it. Obviously, shameless plug, if you want some help getting there, I can definitely get you to the 12% or more number annualized over the next you know, several decades. But this is what we're talking about here. This is why sometimes you see people who have fairly modest jobs. You know, I remember growing up, like my, my circle of friends growing up, all different, their, their parents had all different jobs. And I remember, you know, my best friend, his parents, his, his dad was an, an oil 
um, you know, vice president of an oil company, made a ton of money. But the actual friend that I had growing up, their parents had quite a bit of money. One was a teacher and one was a nurse. And they actually had quite a bit of money. So I obviously, when I was 12 years old, didn't ask them how they invest, but I suspect they were minimalists. I mean, not totally frugal. They had ski trips on the weekend and they went hiking and they did all the stuff. They lived in a nice neighborhood, but I would imagine they probably made a reasonable rate of return and they saved money. So it is possible to do, like I said, for that person who makes $67,500, we're talking about the average American here, this person can actually do it by making a 1% rate of return, right? Now, obviously the numbers get pretty attractive looking if you can also have a decent income and boost things up further. So let's say you were able to save $1,000 a month and you're also able to do the 1% a month rate of return. Again, it's not gonna be like clockwork. Not, we're not talking about 1% every month. You're gonna have plenty of losing years among this. You're gonna have drawdowns. You're gonna have periods where it doesn't work, but long-term 12% rate of return. We're talking about now a person who's, you know, kind of approaching the 10 million range. Again, that's over 40 years, but even if the person only did it over 30 years, they're still gonna hit $3 million. So the active investor, that's the key to all of this. You have to find a way to get away from that buy and hold because buy and hold might look attractive at the tail end of a 12 year bull market. It might, there might be people out there that look at it and go, you know what? The Vanguard V-Banks, the 60-40 stock bonds, it hasn't done that bad in the last 12 years. Maybe I'll just do that. Well, you're not counting all the bear markets along the way. You're not counting from 1995, including the dot-com bust that took 16 years to break even. You're not including 25 years of inflation that's about to get worse. Long-term buy and hold is a disaster for almost everybody. And unless you have a very high net worth or you have a very high income, or you're an extreme minimalist, and you're one of these people that just lives totally off the grid, then I don't know how you make your income, but it's just not gonna be good enough. And I don't wanna set people up that I get paid, but at the 30 years from now, you're gonna have a, a, a really bad realization that, oh wow, I really messed up. I put myself on a train 30 years ago, and now it's going to a, you know, a station that I never get there. You know, I'm gonna have to work till I'm 80. I don't want people to be in that situation. And I'm also not a person who's saying you need millions of dollars, but I want you to be in a position where you can choose what you do in your retirement. So if you get $2 million and you wanna be a minimalist and give half of it to charity, that's awesome, do that, that's great. But I want you to be able to choose. I don't want your retirement to be forced upon you because you listen to a financial advisor who makes one and a half percent of your net worth all the time telling you to do something that's a complete failure. I, I really, I would like to encourage people to consider the source, consider the bias that they have, and consider the math. It just mathematically doesn't work out. You, you've got to find a way to do it. And um, leave you with one final quote. Like I said, I'm not calling anybody a loser, but it is kind of a loser's attitude to, to when you see something hard, you choose not to do it because you think it's too difficult. Again, I'm, you know, maybe, I, I mean, obviously I, I was raised by great parents. They encouraged me, they gave me confidence, they made me chase my dreams. But I, I just was back then when somebody says, you know, this is too hard for you, you can't do it. There's only 20% only of people can do that. My attitude is watch me, you know? If you're gonna tell me that 80% of Wall Street can't make a 12% rate of return, and therefore by proxy, I can't either because I'm a human and they're a human and they didn't do it, so therefore I can't do it. I don't look at other people's lack of success as a deterrent for my own. I'm an individual person. I just roll up my sleeves and say, watch me. So um, I hope a lot of you watching this will get the message as well that don't let people tell you you can't do something. It, it, investing is hard, let's be honest. It is, it is very difficult, but you can do it. And if you can't do it, and if you don't have all the free time, there are people out there that can help you. Not that many, but you can seek them out. There is help out there for you. Uh, it's a long-term process. Like I said, there'll be many failures along the way. There'll be times when you think it's not working and oh my God, it's down and this is, you know, I gotta get off. That's gonna happen too, but 
you know, 30, 40 years later, the reward for getting a few extra percent is, um, I mean, it compounds astronomically high. So that's my presentation. Um, obviously, no offense to any of those people that I singled out. Like I said, I actually kind of like those people, but not for investing advice for different reasons. But, you know, I guess that's why people should stay in their lane. I don't uh, bounce around on stage, to, you know, giving seminars to people about confidence and I don't, you know, I don't do all that stuff. It's not my lane. So perhaps people shouldn't be telling millions and millions of followers to do something that will guarantee their failure. Uh, I think that's a little bit unethical, but all right. Hopefully everybody enjoyed that and you have a little bit of new perspective on how you're going to attack your investing going forward. Let me get into some of these questions for all of you. So starting from the top, two questions regarding the option strategies, UVXY butterfly, spy iron condor, when you allocate 1% in the butterfly, well, I'm reading, I'm not showing it. When you allocate 1% in the butterfly, 3% to iron condor, do you add up many of this until you reach 20%? Okay, I know where you're going with this. So the, for example, the broken wing butterfly in our portfolio has a 1% allocation. So what I do here is I allocate 1% of my net liquidation value to this trade. That's it, 1%. But what you don't do is add it all up to try to get 20 because this strategy actually occupies 20% of my overall portfolio. But the problem is options themselves are extremely capital efficient and they don't require very much money to open. So if you're in a situation where you're allowed 20% of this much money, like I'm allowed $50,000 into this strategy, that would be an enormous position size. So I do the 1% and I'm allowed two of them. So no, you don't do 20 of these added together. That would be insane. The reason we do 1%, this trade only costs $2,300 to open, right? If I had to open a trade that I actually utilized the full 50,000, it would be enormous and you just don't do that. The iron condor is the same thing. This is an efficient trade. So this trade is part of a strategy that will probably next week or maybe shortly occupy once again, 20% of the overall portfolio. But iron condors don't cost all that much money to open. So you can't use the standard method of sizing these trades. I have to look at this size trade and determine what percentage of my overall net worth I would put to each individual trade. And then I can use that number and I can allow myself a few extras. So for this strategy, probably allow three available positions. It wouldn't be, you, do, you don't just keep going until you add up to 20. That would be a disaster. Um, you know, you might be happy if it worked out for you, but if you get into trouble, boy, you could, you could lose a lot more money. So I make sure that when we factor in the 50% stop loss, that that amount of money is relatively speaking, a good risk reward profile. So with option trading, with equity trading, if I tell you put 20% of your money in the NASDAQ, you just put 20%. You just take your 20% of your net worth, divide it by the share price, and that's how many shares you buy the NASDAQ. Option trading, you cannot do that because it's very capital efficient. So you'd end up with enormous trade size. So in the daily emails, when I say 1%, super easy. Just take 1% of all of your total net liquidation, that's how much capital you allocate to that trade. Iron condors, when I say 4%, allocate the 4%. That's how you do it. And in fact, you should watch the private live stream we did just two days ago for the private community, just for the VTS community. I went over all of this in detail. So I know your name, you are a member of the community, so you should have had, had access to that live stream. Go watch that. Um, I talked about iron condor specifically for about an hour. I covered it in every detail. So. Um, Check that out for sure. All right. Oh, my head is absolutely killing me. Golf in 47 degree weather, not recommended. Um, won't be able to make it live. What do you think of rethinking investing and drawdowns to something like an OTM out of the money covered call and shares with varying ratios such as 50% covered and 50% only shares? I know where you're going with this, but the point is that over time, the covered calls will add up and probably provide realized profits, so the drawdowns on unrealized are less. 
Okay. Again, this is one of those things that people often get derailed by fairly bad advice in the financial industry. But, I mean, I was going to say just trust me, but you don't actually have to trust me. I did actually, I think I backed this up with some numbers. But what you want to do is you want to go to the YouTube channel and you want to search iron, uh, covered calls because I'm sure, I hope it wasn't private. I hope it was public. This one here, covered calls suck. You definitely want to watch this one. So uh, essentially the punchline of that video is the problem with covered calls is it's an incredibly awesome strategy from a marketing perspective. When you talk about it and you explain it to somebody, it sounds like it should work out extremely well. But the problem with covered calls is you're capping the gains that you can potentially make and you're not really reducing your downside. Right, if you sell covered calls on, a, on shares that you hold, you're only getting a very tiny premium for that. And then you're capping your gains. So if the stock goes up, did you say a distance out of the money? Because that would be helpful. Note covered calls is always 1% to 2% above the market. Okay, so you're, you're going to get a, a smaller premium for that. But if your stock goes up more than, or your ETF more than 2%, you're going to lose your shares but you're not reducing your downside by more than the actual premium of the covered call. So if it goes down 20%, you're down 19 and a half. If it goes up more than two, you're out. So covered calls, and this is something that I'll do in a future video talking about iron condors and why they worked so well in the early 2000s and you know the 1990s, but not so much anymore. That also applies to the covered call problem is that just look at the way that markets are moving right now. Violent in both directions. This is a terrible idea to be selling covered calls when you're in a market that is violent in both directions. Because the downside, you reduced your, your drawdown by what, 0.5%? It's nothing. You're still in a full drawdown. The upside, you're going to miss all of those violent moves. All of those bull market rallies, you're going to be blocked out almost immediately. You're doing 2% out of the money. You're not going to make any money, but you're going to suffer all of the losses. So covered calls, unfortunately, is a strategy, again, you get a lot of influencers and a lot of people who claim to be options experts telling you to do a strategy that really sounds awesome in a textbook, but in practical use, it does not come out ahead. I mean, you can check all the buy right indexes, you can check the put writing index, the iron condor index, selling premium itself hasn't worked for 15 years. There's no edge anymore to be a premium seller. But in the early 2000s, sure. And especially in the early 2000s with reasonable bull markets that didn't rage higher and then crash lower like we're seeing. You know, all the volatility spikes, all the largest ones in the last 30 years or in the last four years, we're in a market that that would be a terrible idea. So I know what you're getting at. And you've probably been influenced by a few people saying that, oh, how great you, should, you can get paid for stuff you already hold. I mean, why not rent it out to other people? It's so much worse than that. It, again, it sounds good in theory. It does not work in practice. So at VTS, we do not sell covered calls on our long ETF positions. We are in them because we're trend followers. And the last thing you want to do is cut off that trend because the downside is there. It's lurking. It's going to happen to you. It's happening to me right now. Well, I mean, join the club 2022. Who isn't losing money this year? Um, it's going to happen to you. So you're going to need those profitable periods to offset the losses. Covered calls is, is, is not, a, uh, not a profitable strategy. Yep. Wifey coming in to say hi. Okay. Cool comment. Pickle juice. What is that? Pickle juice. Gross, but it works. Um... God, I have no idea what you're... Oh, are you talking about because I told you I had heat stroke and... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's it. To honor your stops, Jonathan King. Sorry. I'm trying to keep up with... The conversations in the chat sometimes are hard to keep up with, so... Um, you guys might be talking amongst yourselves. Which is fine. Have conversations. If you do want to ask a question, sometimes it's better to say, like, question and, and make sure that it's actually clear. But uh, what did you say, Jonathan King? The problem with working hard when it comes to active investing is that the harder you work, the more you lose, at least for most people. 
So I don't agree with, I mean, obviously no offense. Thank you for the comment. I, I don't agree with that at all. What, do, what are you even talking about? The harder you work, the more you lose. Is that, that sounds like one of those like adages that people sort of repeat, but doesn't really mean anything. Like how could you justify that comment? That's in no walk of life. Is that true? I mean, obviously the better, the, the more you focus and the, the better you do, it's going to work out. And then that last part, again, at least for most people, I don't, I don't navigate my life based on what most people do. I don't, I'm not being offensive on the people that are average income, the people that are average savers, the people that are average health, the people that are average golfers. Have at it, do your thing. But I am not trying to be average. I'm not deterred by people failing. That just means that I need to try harder than they did. That's what I view that as. So I don't agree with this at all. I don't know if that's some type of circular logic where the harder you work, the worse you do. I don't even know why that would be the case, but it sounds to me like you've got some cognitive biases working against you there. No, hard work is worth it. It really is. I mean, that's just what we were taught when I was younger, and that's what I was encouraged to do, is obviously move towards hard things, because that means there's reward there. For me personally, my longest running option strategy and my most successful strategy is VIX options, right? Trading options directly on the VIX. That strategy, the VIX index itself is obviously much more complex than the NASDAQ or the S&P, so it's probably my most complex strategy. It's the one that's the most active, probably 20 to 30 trades per month. And it's the one that will be quite a challenge to explain to people, right? It's, it's gonna be difficult, but it's my best performing strategy. I chase that because I know that most people are not gonna put in the work to understand the VIX index, to understand strategies that are complex, but rewarding. Most people chase the easy stuff. Look at my followers online. Not very many people in the grand scheme of things, right? There are people who are selling the dream, easy strategies. Oh, just do this. It's just a simple technical analysis. You'll make millions. You'll be like me in a Lamborghini. Those people have hundreds of thousands of followers. Why? Because people like easy. They like to chase easy stuff. I'm never going to sell that idea to people that what we should do is just do the easy thing that everybody else does. No, we should not. So... That's a little bit of a side rant, but move towards difficult things and then work hard. And that's how you separate yourself from the crowd. Don't ever say, because somebody else failed, that means I probably will too. That's not a good attitude to have. Why do you think buy and hold won't work even though there will be long-term productivity growth leading to higher earnings? Oh, I just showed you why it won't work. The rate of return is already dismal. And that is in a really good period for the market. We're facing a period where this 4.22, if I had to put money on it, the next 17 years of the all-weather portfolio is not going to be 4.2. That's why. It doesn't matter about earnings growth and stuff. That's always offset by wages and inflation and interest rates. There's never, you can't get away from that equation. So yeah, sure, if, if earnings in S&P companies go up, the actual nominal value of the stock market might go up, and the actual dollars in your bank account might look like you have a lot of dollars, but when you inflation adjust and you, you include interest rates and wage stagnation and all of these things, you're not moving forward. It's just the number looks a little bit better, but we have to do everything on a relative scale. So no, it, like earnings expansion and companies growing in the future is not going to make this situation better. It's actually going to make it worse because um, these things are just getting hyper complicated. The inflation, wage growth, they're decoupling from, from what they should be doing. So I suspect the next couple decades is going to be rough. This might be true. Well, not the end part. I disagree with buy and hold, but it's also unrealistic to think average people can beat the market when it's a zero-sum game. I don't view investing as a zero-sum game. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, you, for the simple reason, you've got a lot of intermediaries who are trying to make money in different ways. And certainly from an options perspective, it's never a very good idea, even though maybe technically it's true, it's never a good idea to view things as zero-sum. Um, 
but also it might be unrealistic to assume that somebody who has a full-time job, who has kids, who has hobbies and an, a life elsewhere, it might be unrealistic to ask that person to spend two or three hours a day on their investing. So you are probably right in that sense. But what I said, remember, is that we are talking about also putting in the effort, rolling up your sleeves and diving into people's body of work and determining who can help you. That's also part of active investing. I'm not actually saying that all the 330 million or 220 million Americans that are adults actually do it themselves. No, that wasn't really my point. My point was there are ways to be an active investor. And if you can't do it, there are ways to find people who can. That would, that would be something that uh, you should look into. If you don't have the time to do it yourself, that is a valid point. It, investing is not easy. So seek out people who can help you and try, try to filter out the, I mean, I always say it shouldn't be that difficult. Like people who are genuinely helping, it should be somewhat obvious who the charlatans are and who the, who the people who are really trying to help are. Twitter is not a good place to find people to help you. So um, there are ways, I, I'm trying to dance around it. Of course, like obviously shameless plug, I am one of them, but I'm not the only one. There are people out there. Do your due diligence and, and find somebody who you really think can help you. Doable, very, very doable. Are you net premium buyer or seller? If you can leverage using options without borrowing money, why do people buy stocks on margin? So the first part, I'm neither. I basically sell things that are expensive, buy things that are cheap. That's what it is. There's, like I was trying to hint at before, there's no inherent advantage anymore to being a seller, right? Maybe 20 years ago, you could say, no, you always sell the premium, right? The in implied volatility is going to be higher than the realized and the sellers, the smart money, the buying volatility, those are the dumb people. That's not the case anymore. There's no inherent advantage to either one of them. So there are plenty of times when buying volatility and going long volatility is the smarter play. And there are, of course, times when going short volatility. I have a portfolio of both. I have multiple strategies, over 10, but I mean, I'll introduce as many as I can over time. But, you know, iron condors, typically net short, you know, net short premium. But, you know, broken wing butterflies are not really a volatility bias. I've got earnings plays, which are long straddles, so it's long volatility. I mix it all up. Um, I'm looking for edge wherever I can find it. I don't fall into the old traps of you have to do this and stuff everything into that or what do they say, jam a square peg into a round hole. No, there are plenty of times when being long vol is the advantageous position. So I look for them. And um, if, if you had like gun to my head, I'm probably 60 to 70% leaning on the short vol side, but I, I have plenty of option trading that focuses on long positions. What is the alternative proposed to buy and hold? What is the alternative? The alternative is active investing in many forms. So what I personally do, I can only speak on what I personally do, but I have a roughly 60% of my portfolio in tactical strategies. So using ETFs, basically the same ones that Jack Bogle and Vanguard, the same ones that they are, they're going to be using. I like Vanguard. I just don't like the hold it forever and don't do anything. Um, but then I'll tactically rotate. Like there are times when you should be in the stock market. There are times when you shouldn't be. There are times when utilities are a much better play than stocks. There's a time when you should be in bonds. There's a time when gold might perform well. I mean, long-term gold does poorly, but you can be tactical about it and you can isolate certain periods in the market that display characteristics that might make gold a, a reasonable risk reward profile. So I'm a tactical investor. And then 40% of my capital is options trading. So with options, it's discretionary and it's obviously it's active. You're in and out of positions. And so that's what I'm proposing. I propose people either themselves learn the skills or find somebody who can. Um, when is your options class coming out? Oh, I hate these questions because I wish I could tell you it's tomorrow, but it's not. It's not tomorrow. 
Um, God, I'm, I'm really, really hoping. Because I, I don't even want to say it, but I'm hoping like to... I'm going to say it because there's not that many people listening. Two, two months, something like that. I'm not going to rush anything out. It has to be done well. If you know me, you know my work, you know I'm a very thorough, detail-oriented person. I'm not just going to rush something out there. So, um, what is this? Oh, I've got a hater in the comments. I'll review that later. There's always one or two. Um, I'll take a screenshot of that so I make sure I review that. Um, haters are welcome as well. I, there's, everybody's welcome. I, I don't block people. I don't do that, so... Feel free to say what you're going to say, criticize what you're going to criticize. Um, I, I'll just say just in general, there isn't a thing somebody could say that would even, you know, put a dent in my confidence. So, but you can try your best. You can do whatever you want to do. Uh, do you think that living in a city named Dubai <laughs> has a subconscious effect that makes, that tends to make you buyer versus seller of options? That's funny. Yes, I am in Dubai. Um, and yeah, I do buy options probably more than most people do. So very suitable that I'm sitting here. I'll, when, once I introduce the options, I think people will see that it's not really about, um, like a lot of the, again, the, the question earlier about covered calls, that's something that a lot of people will design courses around because it's so marketable. I could sell that like crazy. A, a, a course that just buys an underlying security and then just tell people to rent it out? I mean, why wouldn't you rent it out? I already own the S&P 500. Why wouldn't I sell covered calls, right? It just makes perfect sense. Um, selling iron condors. Why wouldn't I just do that every month? Just sell one iron condor every month. Boom, boom, boom. There you go. Why wouldn't I sell UVXY vertical calls every Monday? Sell it. Close it every Friday. Open a new one Monday. Close it every Friday. There's a lot of things that people say out there that sound like, yeah, that really sounds like it makes sense. That's a good strategy. That's, uh, why didn't I think of that? And then you do it in real time and, and you know, none of it works. So, um, yeah. I'm obviously going to tell people based on my experience, which is, is long, like 17 years is enough time for me to call myself a relative expert on the subject. And I just... 100% tell the truth. So, you know, don't mean any offense anytime I say something like don't sell covered calls. It's a bad strategy. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not insulting anyone. Just in my experience, it's bad. The risk reward profile doesn't pay off. Um, long volatility is sometimes a good play, things like that. Thoughts on algo trading and someone automating their strategy. Um, so this is an interesting one, and you're going to see more and more of that in the future because it's becoming far easier to, to write little programs and build bots that can trade things automatically. Um, the, the problem isn't the automatic strategy, and the, the advantage isn't the automation. It still needs to be the strategy, right? You can automate a terrible strategy and then get terrible results. You can manually trade or automate a good strategy and get good results. So don't substitute the quality of the strategy with the ease of execution. There's a lot of services that are popping up out there and I see them as well. I'm in this business. I see people and what they're doing. And I know that there's a lot of websites now that are basically just giving you a whole bunch of bots and they'll show you a bunch of back tests and then they'll allow you to follow that. Well, I mean, what time is it? It's, it's 10 o'clock right now. Before before midnight, I could get out a spreadsheet and I could crank out five or 10 back tests that look amazing. And then I could hire somebody on Fiverr or Upwork to automate that. And I could have a website up and running next week with 20 really amazing looking back tests and bots and automation and everything. I could have that up and running next week. But 99% of back tests fail in live trading. So what are you buying? You're buying the ease of automation of a very likely garbage strategy. So I would always bring you back to first analyze whether it's even a good strategy. And then if it is, you can go to step two and maybe find ways to make it easier to trade, but don't substitute the two. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's too bad. Um, okay. 
hater says legit question. Okay. It's a legit question, not hate. You can hate if you want. Honestly, I don't care. Um, my live streams are public for everybody. My Twitter account's public. No, no blocking. It's a legit question, not hate. Advocating against buy and hold requires an alternative. If VTS is the alternative, it has to beat buy and hold. If it hasn't for five years, it's not worth discussing. I, I don't know how terrible your math is, but um, we are miles ahead. Um, obviously, I'm not going to get into a discussion with somebody who can't calculate basic numbers, but uh, incorrect, good, good attempt. I know you're trying to smear something, but uh, no, incorrect. So I do advocate for active investing, and I do provide a method of people to do that. But I will always be the first to say, do your due diligence and do a lot of it. Don't just surface, hey, I kind of like what this person's saying. Do a lot of due diligence. And there's many, many choices out there. I would never represent that I am the only choice. So, hey, if you like me, follow my work. If you don't, here's an idea. Don't follow my work. See how easy that is? Nobody's pulling in, nobody's twisting your arm to do anything. We're talking to among adults here. And if you want to follow someone's work, that's all I'm doing is sharing my portfolio. Do you see me doing YouTube ads and standing next to Lamborghinis? I've never done a single advertisement in my life. I've never done one blast email to my mailing list. Not one. Never sent a thing. Hey, sign up now. It's only this price. Zero marketing. Follow my work if you like me. Don't follow me if you don't. Or at least don't pay me. Follow for free. I mean, join the live streams. Most of what I do is available. But, I mean, stop pretending you're seven years old. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's unbelievable, this, this culture, cultural direction that we are going, that people can't seem to take any personal responsibility about anything. So I would say for you, 100% don't follow. Don't ever pay me a penny. Absolutely not. If you have any gripe at all, if there's any red flags, and this applies for me and everybody else, this is just a general lesson out there. Because most of the people you're encountering are going to be online. You're not going to know them in person. They're not going to be recommended to you by a dozen people you know. You're, you're finding people online. If you sense any red flags, if you sense any unethical behavior, if you get a hint that, you know what, he seems to be contradicting himself. I listened to him two weeks ago, he said this, and now he's saying that. If you get any vibes like that, don't pay them money. If you get vibes on me, don't pay me money. If you hear me saying things a month ago that I'm saying differently today, either stop paying or don't pay. This seems obvious. You should be an adult. You don't need to be told this. So um, there's my little rant against a, a hate for no reason. Um, sorry to everybody else had to listen to that. Pickle juice for heat stroke. Okay. I'm, I'm not into... What am I supposed to do with the pickle juice? I don't think I'm going to follow this advice. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Any key points on not overfitting back tests? Yeah, I should do a full video on that because it is a, I mean, it's so difficult, right? I think the one thing that I will tease here and the thing that I always say is for me personally, I don't ever optimize for performance and that really helps a lot. What most people do when they're constructing back tests is they will either do a spreadsheet or they'll use one of the back testing softwares and they'll basically be changing the input variables until the thing looks really nice and until the performance is really good and you're optimizing for performance but you know by definition that's past performance and there's no reason the market would hit those same levels now so i tend to optimize for things like trade frequency like if you say, I, you know, I want to be in a trade, I want to be in equities for 65% of the market. And then for 35, I'm going to be looking for other things. That is a much better way to construct a back test because at least you're not juggling the numbers and trying to optimize and make it look exceptional. You're just saying that in any given investing year, I'm comfortable holding stocks 65% of the time, or I'm comfortable holding long volatility 7% of the time. Optimize for that, you've, you've done a little bit better. Um, 
optimizing for performance will probably land you with back tests that look awesome and then fail in live trading. So, uh, but I will definitely dedicate a full video or live stream to this in the future. Um, our trade, our trade, any stocks or just volatility for me in my portfolio, uh, we don't trade individual stocks. Now there are times in option trading where I might, oh, well, there are some strategies where we definitely do cause we need a small dollar value. But for the most part, I am a person who likes to stick to broad based indexes like the Q's, like the IEF, like GLD and TLT and SPY and all these things. Um, I tack, my active investing is not probably what you've seen out there. I'm not the whole big return type person. I'd be, if you said you can take your 12% right now for the next 40 years, I might have to think about that. Like I definitely do better than 12, but a lot of people should probably take the 12 and run. So I'm not trying to get these world beating numbers. I'm just trying to, you know, we go through bad periods as well, but long term, 15, 18% type stuff. So I can definitely get that by using indexes and, and very highly liquid things. We don't need, we don't do any small stuff. We don't do any like micro cap stuff, all that's garbage, low liquidity options. No, you can take all that off the table. What were the mistakes you made early on in your investing career? How long have we been going? How many hours do you have? I've made every mistake in the book. I make mistakes all the time. I still make mistakes. Not often. I've got my streamlined process, but I still make mistakes now. I've made a couple this year. Um, I made one mistake that was just, uh, you know, sometimes calling something a mistake is odd because at the time I believed it to be the correct thing to do. So it's not really a mistake. It's just something that shouldn't have done, didn't work out well. But at the beginning of the year for, uh, for when I do my annual allocation changes, one of my strategies that trades the NASDAQ, I actually bumped up that allocation a little bit. And the one that trades the S&P 500 mid cap ETF, the MDY, I actually bumped that one down a little bit. And what do we know about 2022? Well, of course, for the previous 12 years, that little adjustment in allocations was a good thing. But 2022 comes and what was down the worst? The NASDAQ. So I took an extra little loss there. Um, I still do stuff like that. It's, it's all a learning process. My options trading, sometimes I make mistakes and you store it, you analyze it and you add it to your knowledge base. And mistakes are how we learn. It, it really is. My golf career, I made every mistake in the book, and that's how I became a professional. My investing career, I make mistakes. I used to make them way more often, but I still do. It's fine. You just don't want to make mistakes that cost you several years of progress, right? As I always say, live to fight another day. Don't ever do anything that if it goes badly, it could really derail your future progress. But don't be afraid of mistakes. You have to take risk to get the reward. So we take calculated risks. I don't ever do anything crazy, but sometimes some of the things that I try, the market has other ideas. It just says, nope, not this year. Um, w what I'm doing this year for my tactical investing, options are crushing it, but tactical investing, the market has just told me quite clearly, nope, what you're doing is not working this year. So it is what it is. You know, you, you fight through it, you live to fight another day, but Maybe I'll um, put together, that's a good one. I always add it to my li list of future videos, but like a top 10 mistakes or top five mistakes that I've made. Yeah, one of the benefits of following somebody with experience is that beyond the trade signals that I give people, sometimes just not making the same mistakes that I did, right? I've already made them, so you don't have to. Sometimes following somebody for just that reason is worth it, so. Um, I think that's it. I, my wife should not still be awake and watching my live stream. It's not that exciting. Go to sleep. What are you doing? <laughs> you don't need to do this. That's it. That's all the questions. Fortunately, I don't like when I get haters because I feel pretty strongly that, I mean, you'd, it's hard to say stuff like this because obviously I'm biased and I'm complimenting myself and it might come across as arrogant, but 
I think you'd have to scour the internet to find somebody that puts more effort into their investing and sharing it publicly, ethically, responsibly, transparent. Find me them. Where are they? Like, and then I get a hater? How do I have a hater? It doesn't make sense. So please don't do that. If we have a disagreement, we can be two adults with a disagreement. But to be a hater, that makes no sense. There is no foundation for that. And I will remind you, hate comes from below. So don't forget that what you say to me, if it's going to be disagreeing with me, awesome. I make mistakes all the time, like I said. If it's going to be disappointment in performance, I have drawdowns as well. Awesome, we can talk about that. If it's going to be hate, I'm not going to receive your message the same way you think I'm going to receive your message. Haters always think that if they throw, you know, throw garbage at people, that it's going to hurt them. It doesn't. <laughs> Trust me, for the audience watching, it only looks bad on you. It reflects badly on you. So I am all for constructive criticism and disagreements and everybody can get along and it doesn't matter your background, your, you know, your, your religion, your politics, I don't care. If you're a supporter of the guy that I don't like, cool, we can still be friends. But um, boy, I would, I would challenge you to find somebody who works harder to share valuable investing lessons than me. And, and if you can find them, please forward that to me so I can learn from them. I can say, wow, I thought I was doing good. Look at how awesome that guy is. Forward them to me. I'd love to see it, but don't think that attacking my character is gonna have the effect you think it will. It most certainly will not. Um, and for everybody else watching this live stream, um, we will do one next week and everybody is invited, including haters. I get so few. It's actually kind of a, I had one, one hater about a year ago and it actually prompted me to make a full video. The guy was like, oh, this guy's a paper trader. He doesn't even trade his account. So I made a whole video basically just showing my live fill prices and, um, you know, not for nothing. I hate talking about business, but I did get quite a few subscriber signups after that video. So he kind of did help me out a little bit. Um, but yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just a guy like you guys. I, I'm not perfect and I'm doing my best and I'm trying to share things that I hope you guys find interesting and I hope you can learn from and uh, you can disagree with me if you want. You can even strongly criticize me if you want, but obviously not character and morals and ethics. Don't do that because that's just gonna bounce off. So thanks everybody. Oh wait, that's interesting, that caught my eye. How do you like being married to me? Yes, please. Tell the good sir what it's like being married to me. What do you think? I think it's pretty good. It's probably pretty good because um, I can comfortably say she's not going to answer you. Um, we speak Chinese amongst ourselves, so if you're asking her to explain in English... She's probably, it's going to look good for me because uh, she's going to plead the fifth on that one. Haters just lost money and angry on everyone. I mean, honestly, I, I think I went an, a little bit hard, but the point still remains. I don't obviously take back anything. It, it's haters are, I mean, they're children. But um, this year has been exceptionally bad performance wise across the board for for so many people that it's actually kind of understandable that people get upset about bad performance um boy i wish i wish i could have delivered better this year i really do but i mean i've been doing i've been sharing my performance publicly on a public website every month for 11 years, actually 13 years, but 11 since I launched my business. Again, open challenge. Find me one person online who has done that. One, and I'll take it back. Find me one person who reports their performance, knowing that sometimes it's bad and I don't want to post it. I do anyway, because I think it's important for people to do their due diligence on who they're following. So if I'm doing such a terrible job, Surely you could find more than one person that's doing better than me. 
I will be waiting for your email. I suspect I'm not going to get one. So the last 10 minutes was a harsh rant. Maverick of Wall Street. Okay. Maverick of Wall Street. Okay, I'll look that up. I am, I'm genuinely asking. Like, I would love to get a little working list of five or six people that are, are really putting in strong efforts and being totally transparent and posting the good and the bad performance and just being free to show people. Like, 99% of the investment world doesn't show performance. Are you crazy? Financial advisors don't show performance. None of them do, ever. Not one day of performance. All of those funds and all of those experts you see on Twitter, not a single one of them posts a day of performance. None. So, I mean, what are we talking about here, right? So I feel great about what I've done and I'm gonna continue to do it. That's another one, add it to the list. Yeah, if anybody, I mean, feel free to, to shout people out. I don't mind if somebody says, uh, don't post any third-party links, though, because YouTube might pick that up. But, um, yeah, uh, feel free. I, I would love for you all to share the, the little diamonds in the rough that you have found, because there aren't that many of them out there. And uh, if you have found a few people who will put in the time to answer all your questions publicly and just, you know, off the cuff live. It, this is not easy, by the way. Um, start posting them so people can learn and follow five or six of the really good people. That'd be great. Should actually maybe put a list together. I'll do some research on these ones you guys mentioned. I no longer say you're wrong to someone. I say we have a different perspective. That's a very good way to, a good rule. I mean, this, this day and age that we're living through, it's, it's a nightmare, isn't it? We've got, uh, you know, obviously a ton of people who can't take personal responsibility. That's a problem. We've got people who, you know, you, you disagree with one thing somebody says, and all of a sudden we're enemies. Right? It's just so polarizing. You may sit down and have a conversation with that person and realize that nine out of 10 subjects, you guys totally are in agreement and you, you're, you're best friends. But they say one thing, you're like, ah, wrong, nope, you're terrible, you're stupid, you're awful, you're a fraud. That's the culture we live in now, it's crazy. You know, People make one mistake, people do one thing wrong and everybody's looking to just crucify them for it, it's crazy. Got to just be happy and proud of your own work and hate just bounces off you. It really does. You can't, you can't let people. Um, what's that old saying? It's a really good one. Um, don't ever take criticism from someone you would not take advice from. There you go. If you're not in my inner circle of people that I trust, if my wife, come, <laughs> if my wife comes in and tells me I'm doing something wrong, I'm going to immediately listen to that criticism. I'm gonna say, oh, wow, well, I respect your opinion. What did I do? Explain it to me, you know? Uh, if somebody that I would not take any advice from is going to hurl criticism at me, it's kind of like, does it matter, really? What time do you stream? I always catch the end. Um, it's not set in stone, but I typically like to do 1 p.m. Eastern time. And um, what I suppose I should do is every so often I should flip that and I should try to do one in the morning. It's gonna look terrible with the, the lighting, but just to make sure that people in Europe sometimes or Australia, they may be able to catch it live. But 1 p.m. Eastern time for me is 9 p.m. at night. Works out good. I send my daily email, have about an hour to get a bite to eat, and then I do the live stream. So 1 p.m. Eastern. I think my audience is 65% American, so that's, that's also, and then Canadian is another 15, so basically 80% of my audience is North America, so. You no longer say you're wrong, that was a good comment. <clears throat> Generally, a lot of Tasty Trade content is worthwhile for options education, and in my opinion, consistent with what you teach. I think the, my opinion on Tasty is always that it's good for basic stuff. It's good for learning some fundamentals, definitely. Uh, the problem with something like Tasty Trade, 
and it's just getting worse every year. Like 10 years ago, it was probably better than it is now, but it's just, they've got an entire team talking about options now and this strategy and that strategy and let's test this one and that one. There's absolutely no formal direction. It's just a, it's kind of like an encyclopedia of facts, but it doesn't help people narrow down the field to where they actually should be going. So my options course, for example, is going to be hyper specific strategies and recommendations like take your money and do this, or at least this is what I do. And I invite you to follow, right? Nothing's trade advice, but um, Tasty doesn't do a very good job focusing any of it. So people go there and they think, wow, this is great. This is awesome. I'm learning so much. And then, okay, well, now what? What do I do with it? How do I take all of this encyclopedia and put it into something that makes money? Because textbooks don't make money. People who write books don't make money. Strategies, actual profit makes money. So that's what I focus on. My VTS community gets the exact trades in the exact allocation, just do this, right? And then you can look to other places for the education and, and then sort of use them together. I think that would be a good thing to do. All mutual funds might show performance, but uh, fund to fund managers don't, financial advisors who use the mutual funds don't. All of the assets are hidden until you become a member or a you know, an investor. Uh, so incorrect again, but nice try. Tasty trade is good to learn how stuff works, but not how to trade. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I, I would never say anything negative about them, but they got a team of like 15 people. They all do different segments now. They, I mean, you go in there for a month, you're going to just be absolutely spinning in your head. You're not going to know what to do. So you do need to have a little bit of both. You need a little bit of textbook training, some background, some fundamentals, but then you also need people to just say, hey, here's six things that actually work, just do that, right? Um, I think that's where I come in. I'm, I'm not an educator, I'm, I'm a trader. I just do what works. I'm not a golf teacher, I'm a golf professional. I just do what gets the ball in the hole. I don't really know how to teach other people to do it. I just do, just do this, do what I do and the ball will go in the hole kind of thing. For trading as well, just there's my portfolio. It's done very well for 15 years. Just kind of do that and minus a few bad years here and there, it, it should, should get you to the finish line just fine. So uh, let's call that hour 17. Yeah, golf was rough today. I got a crazy headache. I, I don't even know how much water I drank. Every two holes, I drank a bottle bigger than this. So what does that add up to? I might just be waterlogged. Crazy. Golfing in 118 degree weather is, it's a challenge. All right, so um, that was a fun one, right? Started off really well, and then it kind of derailed there at the end. So I will think up another topic for next week and follow me on Twitter, of course. Claim your free trial if you want to see what we do. Again, no obligation, but you can always